So good afternoon everyone. Today we'll be talking about lumbar prolapse intervertebral disc. Okay. So why we want to talk about lumbar PID? As you all know, it is one of the most common causes of low back pain. And low back pain is a very common uh, problem and uh, youngsters and nowadays if you see in OPD, if you see in ortho OPD, 50% of our patients are of back pain and it is more common in the office goers, those who have desk job and they keep sitting in starting from morning till late in evening and they do their work on a laptop and all, all this uh, desktops. So, that's why it's a very important topic and you should be aware about back pain and how to manage these patients, okay? So, first of all, we'll talk about the normal anatomy of the lumbar disc. Uh, what are the contents of the lumbar disc and how it is divided? Basically, if you see this lumbar disc, it constitutes of two parts. One is the nucleus pulposus, that is the central part. If you see this bone model also, look over here. This yellow thing in the bone model is the nucleus pulposus. This is a soft thing and this is nucleus pulposus. And the peripheral thing is the endless fibrosis. So, this normal disc uh, contains this annular nucleus pulposus and annulus fibrosus. So, what are the contents of this annulus uh, fibrosus and the nucleus pulposus? If you see, If you see, now you see this is the sestral section of a uh, cadaver showing nucleus pulposus in the center and annulus fibrosus circumferencing this nucleus pulposus and these are the cartilaginous end plates. So the nucleus pulposus is basically made up of chondrocytic phenotype and it is having a very loose matrix with proteoglycans and proteoglycans have a very specific property, they are hydrophilic in nature and they have water retention potential. So this act as a shock absorber because this is a shock, soft part of the disc and the annulus act as a hard part which contains, contains this uh, nucleus pulposus and it is very rich in collagen, okay. So in a normal young person that this central part is always, you know, loose and spongy. So it act as a shock absorber, it always absorbs whatever the shocks you Whatever stresses are put upon the spine, it absorbs everything, okay. And the annulus tries to hold that within the limits of the disc, okay. So with aging, what happens or with uh, lots of stresses on the spine, what actually is happening? It, the nucleus pulposus undergoes degenerative changes and it undergoes desiccation, okay. So if you see, these are the early changes. This is one of the cadaveric uh, image showing that this line, gray line has started appearing in the nucleus pulposus. So this is the very early uh, degenerative change which has started appearing in the disc. So gradually this gray line will uh, become a whole of the central part will become gray, then it will turn into black. And this nucleus pulposus undergo disintegrative changes, it breaks into pieces, okay. Once it undergoes desiccation, it will break into pieces. So these are the now you see, once all the degenerative changes have happened and the nucleus pulposus have dried out, so if you put normal stresses over the disc, the nucleus pulposus is not able to absorb those forces and these forces are transmitted to the annulus and then annulus cracks and it leads to tear in the annulus and at times these tears are so big, this will allow the nucleus pulposus to come out of the annulus and will come in the spinal canal. There it causes the compression of the now roots and leads to a sciatic or radicular pain, which we call as sciatica, okay. This is one of the images showing the posterior prolapse. Normally, if you see a disc, if you see a disc, it is convex anteriorly. A normal disc is convex anteriorly. So, if it starts undergoing degenerative changes, it will lose its the convexity, convexity and it will become flat. First, it becomes flat, then it prolapses posteriorly, and if it is further, it, it further prolapse, it will lead to an extruded fragment like in this MR image. If you see the disc has come out of its uh, confines and it's lying between the body and the posterior longitudinal ligament. And you can see the canal at the upper level and canal at the lower level. It is getting compromised. 
so this is what i have told you normally if you see the nucleus pulposus will initially start degenerating but there is no bulge but gradually because of the continuous stresses about the spine annulus undergoes cracks and then it starts to prolapse out and if the prolapse is too big and all of the uh, nucleus pulposus has come out and if it is lying between the body and the this posterior longitudinal ligament then we call it as extrusion and when the this extruded fragment loses contact with the main disc then it is known as the sequestered disc because it is a free fragment okay so if you see a normal function of a disc this is a normal uh, spine and a normal disc with normal vertebra if this disc is subjected to say 300 lbs of load so whole of the load is equally distributed throughout the disc so in physiological state a person can do any movement without any pain in the back but if say the disc keep degenerated now you see the disc height at this level in this image and in the previous image the disc height has decreased and it is you know disproportionate so now this same load is uh, put on this spine it will lead to disproportionate uh, spread out of the load and this will lead to abnormal movement at the facet joints even at the even at the time of normal physiological movements and this will lead to back pain okay and this leads to segmental instability because even if the patient is subjected to physiological loads it will lead to abnormal movements in the spine okay so what is actually happening if you go if you see this model so your disc guy if you see this l1 l2 disc l2 3 disc they are of normal height okay but if you see this l4 5 disc it is collapsed now if you put stress over this disc all of the load is not equally distributed at places it will be more at places it will be less and this will lead to abnormal movement happening at the facet joints and this will lead to back pain okay and what will body do to prevent this abnormal movement happening body will try to stabilize the spine and how does it do that it will do by formation of extraneous that is osteophyte the osteophyte when they are formed within the canal they will lead to the compromise of the canal and it will lead to spinal canal stenosis and which will ultimately lead to the compression of the neural structures and the patient will have radicular pain okay so what all will be the causes of low back pain if you have a patient of low back pain you can you cannot straight away say yes the patient is of prolapsed intervertebral disc you will have to have some dd so what all are the causes of low back pain congenital causes they are very less and they are usually seen in the kids at early age traumatic if you ask the history you can pick up that it is a traumatic back pain inflammatory commonly seen in angstrom patients or ra patients neoplastic if you will ask further the patient will give you specific history that the pain increases at night non spinal causes if the pain is coming from this hip joint or si joint that you can pick up with the history and if you examine the patient you can pick that up okay then next is degenerative which is this is the part which we are talking about the degenerative changes in the spine and the biggest cause of the low back pain is the idiopathic in most of the cases we don't know the cause and this idiopathic covers all the postural pain or muscle pain these are all covered under this idiopathic heading so how do we proceed with the patients of this back pain or back pain with radicular pain first of all we will have to take the history of back uh, uh, pain so what is the character of the pain how what kind of the pain it is if it is back pain whether it is a constant or episodic pain whether it increases with cough or sneeze whether it has instability catch so how they make a difference if say the pain is increasing with cough or sneeze then we will be thinking about this because on coughing and sneezing the intra abdominal pressure increases and it puts extra stress over the disc and if say there is a tear in the disc this will further increase the pain constant or episodic if it is a tumor pain it will be present throughout the day it won't settle okay episodic pain if say infective pain hai so because of the stresses at times the pain will increase but the pain will be present throughout the day infection also the pain will be present throughout the day instability catch whenever there is instability in the spine instability means your facet joints are not holding and if say with the movements the spine is moving so if you ask the patient to bend forwards and slowly and slowly 
come back to the standing position, the patient will hold his back in the middle of that position. That is the instability catch, okay, while getting up from the prone position, okay. Leg pain. Now, as you all know, if there is a prolapsed intervertebral disc, the patient will also have this radicular pain associated with the back pain. So, this lag pain can be of three types. It can be radiating pain, it can be referred pain, it can be a radicular pain. So, what is the difference between these three pains? Radiating pain is a pain in which the pain is starting from the site of pathology and it is radiating to a distant site. Okay. So, radiating pain can happen with the hip pathology also. If the patient is having any hip pathology, the pain will radiate along the thigh and it will radiate till the knee. Okay. Referred pain is a pain uh, in which the patient is having pathology at some other site and he is not having pain at that actual site of pathology but is having pain at the distant site other than the site of pathology. Like it happens in uh, appendicular pain. The pain is, uh, pathology is in the right iliac fossa but the pain is happening in the umbilicus. It is not happening at the site of actual pathology. And what is radicular pain? Radicular pain is a pain which follows the dermatomal pattern. If say the patient is having disc pathology at L45, so which root will be getting compressed? L5 root will be getting compressed if you are talking about L45. So patient will have L5 radicular pain. How will it happen? The pain will start from the back of the thigh, back of the butt, back of the thigh and it will go on the lateral aspect of the leg. If say it is L4 radicular pain, it will be going along the medial aspect of the leg. If it is S1 radicular pain, it will go along the posterior part of the leg, along the calf muscles. Okay. So by history only we can make a differential diagnosis ki which radiculopathy we are dealing with, whether it is L4 radiculopathy, L5 radiculopathy or S1 radiculopathy. Now this radicular pain is different from this claudicating pain. How it is different? There are few major differences. Radicular pain is usually a unilateral pain. It happens generally in the one side because the disc is prolapsed on the most commonly on the one side. But if it is a large central disc, patient may have a bilateral radicular pain, but commonly it is a unilateral radicular pain. But in neurogenic claudication, both the limbs are affected equally. Other thing is, radicular pain follows a dermatomal pattern. But in neurogenic claudication, patient won't have any dermatomal pattern. It will be present in whole of the limb. He won't be saying that the pain is going along the lateral aspect. He will say that the pain is very bad, the pain is very bad, the pain is very bad. Other thing is that radicular pain will be present in all the positions, whether the patient is lying down, whether the patient is in sitting position or in standing position. But the claudicating pain will only happen once the patient starts walking. If say he walks for 100 meters or 200 meters, he will say yes, after walking for 500 meters, I have to sit for 10 minutes, then again I can walk for another 500 meters. And he will say that after 500 meters, I will say that my feet are very bad and I will go down, I will not be able to take my feet. वो पेन कम होता है, but it is more of numbness in claudication. और पेशेंट से जब बोलोगे कि आप पहाड़ पे चढ़ जाओगे, मतलब पहाड़ पे चढ़ने में मुझे कोई दिक्कत नहीं, लेकिन पहाड़ से उतरने में दिक्कत होती है। Why? क्यों चढ़ते वक्त we bend forwards. तो bending से क्या हो रहा है? Flexion से क्या हो रहा है? Spinal canal थोड़ा सा increase होता है। तो it helps वो जो compression हो रहा है neural structures पे, that is bit relieved. तो पेशेंट can easily go uphill, but downhill आने में the we are in slightly extended position, so it further compromises the canal and the patient won't be able to uh, move a distance which he is able to go uphill. If say he is, he, he is able to go 500 meters uphill, he won't be able to go downhill 500 meters, he will be able to walk only for 200 meters because of the canal compromise in the extended position, okay. So this is, this claudicating pain happens when the canal is very much compromised and how it happens. The first stage of this degenerative change is the degenerative change in the disc. Then the disc prolapses. But the body is trying to stabilize the spine. So osteophyte formation happens. Ligamentum flavum undergoes hypertrophy. They all lead to the compromise of the canal. And that is the stage when the patient will have this claudicating pain. He won't have this claudicating pain with the simple prolapse intervertebral disc. He will always have radicular pain with the PID, okay? Then we need to ask about smoking history because smoking will also lead to degenerative changes in the spine. Occupation, the laborers or those who have a job of lifting heavy weights, they are having this common, uh, they have this very commonly, this back pain, okay. Office goers will also have this very commonly because their back muscles are not that 
you know, good in shape and they, while they are in office, they are also not taking care of their posture, okay? Sphincters. Why we need to know about sphincters in history? Because if, say, the disc is very big and it is compromising whole of the canal, then you need to know that our now for ball bladder are also passing through that canal. And if it is a large central disc, it will compromise our ball bladder also. So, while taking the history of a back pain patient and if he is having severe radicular pain, you should always ask about perianal numbness or perianal this tingling sensation. Always ask about bowel and bladder, whether there is any problem with bowel and bladder. If so, the patient says, yes, I am having problem with my bowel and bladder, then it is an emergency situation. You need to intervene as soon as possible because the patient is going in coda equina syndrome. If we don't intervene in these cases early, the patient will have lifelong loss of his bladder and bowel control and he will be dependent on catheters or CIC. Okay. So whenever we are dealing with this patient, we should always ask in history whether there is any issue with bowel and bladder. Okay. If, as I told you, the patient is going in coda equina syndrome and it's a re real emergency and the patient requires surgery and it should be done within 24 hours so as to avoid the delayed complications. And if it is done early, the patient will might have full recovery of bowel and bladder. And if it is delayed, patient won't have any recovery and he'll be dependent on catheters and CIC. Past history is relevant because if a patient comes to you with back pain and he says, yes, I'm having back pain for last five days. But if you ask the patient, ki, aisa pehle bhi hota hai, so that means the patient is having the chronic history of back pain. The chronic back pains are very difficult to treat because this pain is going to come again and again. It is because of the degenerative changes. There is no pathology as such. It is because of aging or degenerative changes happening in the disc. So discogenic pain is more in midline and it is in, it increases on sitting. But it is really once the patient is in supine position, okay, or if he starts if he starts walking or standing. Now coming on to examination part. Examination is same as we follow in other this uh, medicine or surgery. We need to first inspect the patient. We need to see the patient from back. We need to see the patient from side. Okay, from back. What is the very typical thing which we can pick in a uh, this prolapsed intervertebral disc patient? I have shown you in the clinics also. If the patient comes with a severe pain, you may find that the patient is tilted toward one side. That is sciatic list. It is not scoliosis. Sciatic list. Sciatic list is different from the scoliosis. How it is different? Scoliosis is a three-dimensional deformity with rotation of the vertebral bodies. But in sciatic list, there is no rotation of the vertebral body. It is just a division of the vertebral bodies. And the body is trying to avoid the pain. How it avoids that? It tilts the body away from the root so that it does not irritate the root and patient is not having the pain. So this list can be, uh, it. the list disappears as soon as the patient bends forwards, the list disappears but the scoliosis will become more prominent with the hump. If you ask the patient to bend forward, the scoliosis will become more prominent. Okay, so you can see that list that is prominent. You can also see the flattening of the spine if you see the patient from the side. You can also pick up the paraspinal muscle spasms. If you see the patient from side, side, you can see that one side is more prominent and the other side is not that prominent. That shows that there is spasm going on in the paraspinal muscles. So after you see the patient, then you feel or palpate whatever you have found on the inspection, you need to confirm all your findings, okay? By palpation. Then comes movement. We need to check all the movements. This is how I was telling you, the patient will have instability. You ask the patient to bend forwards and you ask him to get up slowly. He will stop in the middle of this process and will say he is having severe pain. That is the instability catch and, catch and that is a sure sign of instability happening in the spine. Okay. Then comes special test and neurology. So special test, mein what we do, we do straight leg like raising test and femoral stretch test. In straight leg raising test, we always ask the patient to first of all lift the limb in straight position. Why? We want to rule out if there is any hip pathology. If there will be any hip pathology, patient won't be able to do any movement by himself. Active SLR. First of all, we do active SLR. If there is no pathology in the hip, then we go for this passive SLR. Passive SLR is done for uh, this 
sciatic stretch, but active SLR is done to rule out the hip pathology. If, say, you straight away go and you passively stretch, uh, elevate the limb, if the patient is having a hip pathology also, the patient will wince. So you won't be make out whether he is wincing because of the back or he is wincing because of the hip. So always go with the active SLR first to rule out the hip pathology. If you have ruled out hip pathology, then you can do this passive SLR. This will give you idea about the spine. And if it is, say, if you start elevating the limb and the patient at, say, 30 or 40 degrees say that he is having a pain radiating down his limb, then it is positive SLR. If it is beyond 70 degrees, the patient says the pain, then it is not pos positive SLR. Positive SLR is between 30 to 70 degrees of the angle with the horizontal. And this is generally positive in the discs at L4-5 and L5-S1, this sciatic stretch or uh, SLR test. But femoral stretch test is done whenever you are having pathology at a higher level, say L3-4 disc or L2-3 disc, because they supply the femoral nerve. They form the component of the femoral nerve and they supply the anterior part of the thigh. In such cases, the patient will have the anterior thigh pain. Rather than having posterior leg pain, they will say that the pain is radiating along the anterior aspect of the thigh. So this is done in prone position. You flex the limb at the knee and then you extend the hip. Patient will say, yes, the pain is going along the anterior aspect of the thigh. Now, if you look at this, this is the spine we have cut it from behind, okay? It is like this. We have cut open the canal and we are able to see the dural sac. This is the dura and these are the roots coming out. This is the disc, this is the pedicle. Okay, both the side pedicles are visible and this is the intervening disc space. So, we will talk about L4-5 level. The most common location of the disc prolapse is the posterior lateral, okay? So, this is a posterior lateral disc. This can prolapse in three ways. One is a posterior lateral, that is, this is the most common. So this is the nucleus pulposus and it is coming out in the posterior lateral part of the canal. So in posterior lateral part, you need to know that this is the main dural sac and one root is traversing and one root is coming out. This is the exiting root, okay? Exiting root comes out just below the pedicle. This is coming out just below the pedicle. And one root is traversing and this will come out below. Below, at the level below. So if we talk about L45, so you see one day one root is coming out. This is that root. If we consider this level as the L45 level, this level as the L45, say. This level here, this is L45 level. So this root is coming out. This has nothing to do with that disc. If you see this has come out above that disc. This is nowhere in contact with this uh, root, exiting root. But there is another root which will be coming out at the lower level. This is the traversing root. So if you see over here, this L45 disc and this root has come out. This is the exiting root. And this is one root which is traversing root. This will come out at a level low. So if say there is a disc left at the level of L45, you can always take it or consider it as a posterior lateral disc collapse. If this is VD, so the root is at the level, then This prolapse at the L45 level, but it is in the foramen. Now you see, this is the disc which has prolapsed in the foramen. This is the foramen there, but this is there in the posterior lateral part. It is. So which root is getting from this? If we say this, this is L4, this is L5, this is this part. So the yellow came out. और ये है पोस्टरो लैटरल डिस्क। पोस्टरो लैटरल डिस्क विल अफेक्ट द ट्रेवर्सिंग रूट एंड द फोरमनल डिस्क विल अफेक्ट द एक्सिटिंग रूट। 
तो दोनों में रूट अलग इफेक्ट होता है अगर नथिंग इज स्पेसिफाइड वी ऑलवेज टेक इट एज अटर डिस्प्रोलैप्स एंड वी टेक इट एज कि अगर एल्फो फाइव पी आई डी बोला है तो विच रूट इज गोइंग टू गेट कम्प्रेस और विच रेडिक्लोपैथी विल बी देयर इट विल बी एल्फाइव रेडिक्लोपैथी ओके Now coming on to neurological examination. If say we are talking about L4 radiculopathy, what all things we need to check while checking the neurology? L4 nerve root helps in the ankle dorsiflexion. If the patient is having L4 root affection, then the patient might have foot drop. We need to check for ankle dorsiflexion. We need to check for knee reflex, which is supplied by L4. Okay, and the autonomous sensory zone for L4 is the medial. We are checking for sensory thing. We need to check at the level of medial malleolus. That is for L4. So three things are there for L4. One is the knee jerk. If say we compare it with the other side, if say the patient is having right side radicular pain and he it is radiating along the and back of thigh going along the medial aspect of the leg, so we'll be suspecting L4 radiculopathy. And if we check this right sided knee jerk is diminished, ankle dorsiflexion is slightly weak. And there is diminished sensation at the level of the medial malleolus. Okay, so these are the three things we look for the L4 radiculopathy. And now coming on to L5. So we don't have any any jerk or any deep tendon reflex for L5. We have two things. One is the EHL extensor hallucis longus, which is supplied by L5, and this dorsum of the foot is supplied by L5. But the first web space is the autonomous zone for the L5. What do you understand by autonomous zone? Basically, uh, there is no clear demarcation. The dermatomes are overlapping. Okay, like this part might be supplied by L5, it might be overlapped by L4 or S1 also. But the autonomous zone is a zone which is exclusively supplied by that dermatom. If I am saying autonomous zone, first web space is autonomous zone. That means. This first web space is only supplied by L5. No other dermatome or root will be supplying that part. So, if you want to pick up L5, this uh, sensory loss, so you can check at the first web space. And for this S1, there is the ankle jerk, and the autonomous zone for S1 is the lateral aspect of the little toe. Okay, this lateral aspect of the little toe is the autonomous zone. This is this. Okay, and You can look for the plantar flexion as well, because gastrocnemius is responsible for this plantar flexion and it is supplied by S1 dermatome. So this was about neurology. So what we did, we inspected the patient. हमने देखा क्या कोई deformity तो नहीं है, कोई sciatic list तो नहीं है patient को. We have seen कि whether there is straightening of spine, whether there is any paraspinal spasm. Okay. And on palpation, what all things we have seen? कि हमने feel किया कि yes, one side muscle is spasmodic and other side is not that spasmodic. Other thing, we can feel a step. If a patient is having spondylolisthesis, we can feel a step. If we palpate the spinous process from above downwards, the step will be felt. Okay. Then we check the movements of the patient, whether the movements are painful or not. Then we did special test, SLR or femoral stress test. Then we went for neurology. Neurology will give you an exact idea of which root level we are talking about or which disc level we are talking about. If say I got after examination, after inspection, and after everything. i found out that the patient is having l5 radiculopathy and now the examiner is asking ki what will be your provisional diagnosis which prolapsed intervertebral disc you are looking at so what will you say bolo kya bologe kaun se level ki baat kar rahe hai l5 radiculopathy hum bol rahe hain to kaun sa disc prolapse hoga bolo give it a try L4, L5. लेकिन जब आपने बोला L5 फाइव रेडिक्लोपैथी है तो इट विल बी एट बोथ द लेवल्स आपको प्रोविजनल डायग्नोसिस देना होगा तो आप बोलेंगे इट कैन बी इधर एट L4, फोर फाइव और इट कैन बी एट द लेवल ऑफ एल फाइव एस वन एस ओ क्यों एल फाइव एस वन अगर मान लो फोरामिनल डिस्क है एल फाइव एस वन में तो इट विल लीड टू एल फाइव रेडिक्लोपैथी अगर एल फोर फाइव का पोस्टोलेटल डिस्क है इट विल लीड टू एल फाइव रेडिक्लोपैथी तो जब भी तुमसे प्रोविजनल डायग्नोसिस मांगा जाएगा तो यू हैव टू से येस The disc prolapse can be either at the level of L4-5 or at the level of L5-S1. Again, pucha ka how it can be like that? If say the disc is in the posterior lateral part, then it will be L4-5, and if it is a foraminal disc, it will be at the level of L5-S1. So, ab kaise confirm karoge? What will you order the patient? Kya karoge? Patient ko neurology bhi hai, radicular pain bhi hai, three months ki history hogi hai uski. 
तो वट इज यू आर गोइंग टू आस्क द पेशेंट टू गेट क्या इन्वेस्टिगेशन ऑर्डर करोगे उससे पहले हमें हिप ज्वाइंट रूल आउट करना है बिकॉज हिप विल ऑल्सो गिव अ पिक्चर सिमिलर टू दिस क्योंकि हिप का रेडिकुलर पेन नी पे जाता है हिप में भी ऐसा पेन हो सकता है एस आई ज्वाइंट विल ऑल्सो है बैक पेन एंड दे केन ऑल्सो इरिटेट द नर्व रूट एंड मे लीड टू रेडिकुलर पेन वी ऑलवेज नीड टू चेक फॉर पल्स इफ द पेशेंट इज कमिंग विद अ रेडिकुलर पेन और क्लॉडिकेटिंग पेन इट कैन बी बिकॉज ऑफ द वेस्कुलर क्लॉडिकेशन एज वेल तो ऑलवेज गो फॉर दिस डिस्टल पल्स ऑलवेज चेक डॉर्सल स्प्रीडिस आर्टरी एंड द Posterior artery. If the patient, if you are not able to feel those arteries, then you need you need to keep one provisional diagnosis of a vascular claudication as well. And if the patient is a chronic smoker, then it can be the case. Okay. You also need to check abdomen. Why abdomen? Pelvic inflammatory disease may be back pain. होता है. Okay. And it can it can also mitigate like this. आज एक patient आया था clinics में उसको भी ऐसा ही कुछ था हमारे में. उसको भी ऐसा ही पेन था और एमआरआई में उसके पाउच ऑफ डगलास में फ्लूड था तो वी आर सस्पेक्टिंग समथिंग इज हैपनिंग इन द पेल्विक रीजन ओके इट इज नॉट बिकॉज ऑफ द बैक एज आई ऑलरेडी टोल्ड यू व्हाट इज द व्हाट आर द रेड फ्लैग साइंस स्पिंटर्स आर इन्वॉल्व इफ देर इज सैडल एनस्थीशिया बायोलेटल शियाटिका दिस इज एमरजेंसी एंड यू नीड टू रेफर द पेशेंट एज सुन एज पॉसिबल एंड ही नीड्स सर्जरी विद इन ट्वेंटी आवर्स टू अवॉइड द permanent damage okay so what all investigations we need to get for the patient we need to get the x rays x rays will give us the idea ki yes we are looking at the some pathology or some abnormality is happening at the level this level say l4 5 l5 s1 and then when then we need to order mri because mri is a very you know uh, costlier investigation as compared to the x ray x ray is very cheap you can get it for 100 rupees but For MRI, you need to spend six thousand rupees. So you cannot ask each and every patient to go for MRI. First of all, you need to get the X-rays, and X-rays are also ordered if the patient is having a chronic, say, pain lasting for more than one month and it is not relieving with any medication or exercises. Then you need to go for the X-rays, and if you find something significant on X-ray, then you need to ask for MRI. So if you see this MRI, this disc is white disc, and this both the discs are undergoing. blackening so these are the desiccated disc and if you see the disc height also there is decreased disc height at the level of l5 s1 okay and if you see over here there is a spinal disc this is happening at this level so with mri you can get the clear picture about the disc clear picture about the nerve roots which nerve root is getting compressed which disc is getting affected with x rays you can get a idea if there is a say reduced disc height if there is an this is happening you can get an idea yes this uh, level is affected and we will have a clear picture with the help of mri so these are few x rays you can see there is a lytic list this is happening at the level of l5 s1 the pars is defective ye dekho re pars yahan pe pars kya hota hai basically if you see this is fine pars is a so x ray so you get an idea ki what is actually happening okay then you order your mri and then you will get a clear picture about the thing. this is another x ray showing a vertebral body fracture over here some infective pathology in this if you see the disc height uh, you see in this there is something happening in the intervertebral the vertebral disc area and the both the bodies are also affected this is a mri showing a huge disc at the level of l45 you see this axial sections this whole of the disc has come out and it is causing severe compression now whenever we are looking at a central disc prolapse we have to be very cautious because the patient might land into quadriquina syndrome if it is if he is not intervened early and if it is a bony thing then the patient might have a deep neurology as well okay so on this mri you can see there is a, a this is happening at this level but if you get the standing x rays it will be more because mri is done in supine position so it reduces back okay so we always order uh, standing x rays in spine 
to get an actual idea what is actually happening. So this was all about the etiology, the mechanism, what all things are happening. Now how are you going to manage these patients? Okay. So there are lot many things by which the patient can be managed. Rest, exercises, physio, there are lot many modalities of physiotherapy, TENS, IFT, short wave diathermy, there are lot many injections, medicines, surgery. I need to think, keep one thing in mind, the surgery is, you know, only for say, two to three patient of this radicular patient, radicular pain patients. Our two to three percent patient who has chronic pain, hai, bada disc and it is not getting relieved with all these modalities. This is progressive neurology, hai, this is Corda Equina syndrome. Hai. These are the patients who require surgical intervention. But the rest 95 percent patient, hai, they can be managed with rest, physiotherapy, medications and if uh, proper exercises are done, the patient will recover from all this back pain. So what all medications we can give? We can give uh, NSAIDs, muscle relaxants, okay. Rest, I'll talk to you. Now, the pain is classified into three. Acute low back pain, subacute low back pain and chronic back pain. So acute low back pain is a pain which is lasting for just say zero to four weeks. Subacute, four to 12 weeks. And if it is lasting for more than three months, it is a chronic back pain. So our management will be focused as per the duration of the pain. In pa uh, there is another classification which classifies the back pain into four categories. In category one, the patient is only having low back pain. Category two, there is a black pain, but it does not go beyond the knee. In type three, it is leg pain, but it is not following the radicular pattern. And in type four, there is a radicular pattern is followed. So how we are going to manage these patients now? So the question what all questions arises for rest? How long I do I need to get the bed rest? When to start the activities and when to go for work? Should I start exercises or what type? A patient tumse puchega. Whenever the patient is coming with this uh, complaints, he will always ask is sir rest ka koi role hai ki nahi hai. So actually if you go by literature, the rest has no role. Actually if the patient is having acute back pain, in those cases you can advise rest for say 3 to 4 days. But Beyond seven days, rest has no role in treatment of the patient. It is further going to aggravate the situation. Okay. So we always encourage the patient to start activities as soon as possible. Whenever he feels he has the pain is decreased, he should start his normal activities. And we encourage the patient to go back to his work as soon as possible. If the patient comes to me and he is having acute pain, then only I, I say you take rest for three days. And you come back to me after three days, I will assess you again. If the patient's pain is relieved, I will ask him to join his work and go back to his work because by going back to work, he will stimulate his muscles also and it will relieve his pain, okay? So what is the protocol for uh, rest is followed? If it is a simple back pain, type 1, 2, 3, in acute situations, you can always order rest for three to seven days and increase activity as and when tolerated. And rest is contraindicated in subacute and chronic pain. If a patient is having sick back pain for six months, if you advise rest, it is not going to help him. It is further going to aggravate the situation. And most of the times, the patient will come to you, Ki, sir, mujhe rest chahiye. Kyon chahiye? Mujhe chutti lena hai. Mujhe medical lena hai. Mujhe shadi mein jana hai. To aise patients mein kabhi rest dena nahi hai. Kyunki aaj kal rest, agar aapne char hafte ka rest diya, to you can be challenged in the court, ki aapne char hafte ka rest kyo diya back pain ke liye. Because literature does not support so long back rest, uh, bed rest for back pain patients. Acute pain may you can give it for say three to seven days, but not beyond that. Okay. Or just my radicular pain has neuro deficit in those patients you can give it for say two to three weeks also. Okay. Activity and exercises, as I told you, activity should be increased within the limits of pain and exercises. There are different regimes of exercises. And these exercises are contraindicated in first week of acute pain. And if especially in the patient, those who are having type 4 pain with radicular pain, they are not allowed to do exercises in first week. Okay. Thereafter, the patient is encouraged to start the exercises. In first week, kya karenge fir? First week, we will give medications and we will use the physiotherapy modalities. Kon kon se modalities hain? IFT hai, TENS hai, short wave diathermy. We can use those modalities. So as to relieve the muscle of the spasm and then gradually we can start the exercises. Exercise, kon kon si hoti hai? exercises are 
फ्लेक्शन एक्सरसाइजेज एक्सटेंशन एक्सरसाइजेज योगा तो उसमें इन पेरिस टास्क फोर्स दे हैव फाउंड दैट नो स्पेसिफिक एक्सरसाइज इज सुपीरियर देन द अदर इट इज डिपेंडेंट ऑन द पेशेंट पेशेंट जिसमें कंफर्टेबल यू कैन स्टार्ट दैट रिजीम इफ इट इज कंफर्टेबल विद फ्लेक्शन रिजीम यू कैन स्टार्ट विद फ्लेक्शन रिजीम इफ इज कंफर्टेबल विद एक्सटेंशन रिजीम यू कैन स्टार्ट द एक्सटेंशन रिजीम बट ही नीड्स टू डू एक्सरसाइजेज जस्ट टू टोन अप हिज मसल्स एंड हैव अ लॉन्ग टर्म रिलीफ जो ये एक्सरसाइजेज हैं दे आर नॉट फॉर दिस शॉर्ट टर्म और एक्यूट रिलीफ दे आर फॉर लॉन्ग टर्म थिंग ओके अगर पेशेंट को बार बार पेन हो रहा है इफ यू पुट देम ऑन प्रॉपर एक्सरसाइज रिजीम द पेशेंट विल हैव लॉन्ग टर्म रिलीफ ऑफ दिस बैक पेन दिस आर डिफरेंट स्ट्रेचिंग एक्सरसाइजेस फ्लेक्शन एंड एक्सटेंशन रिजीम्स दिस आर आल्सो स्ट्रेचिंग एक्सरसाइजेस एज आई टोल्ड यू अर्लियर आल्सो देयर आर डिफरेंट फिजियोथेरेपी मॉडलिटीज शॉर्ट वेव डायथेरेपी इंटरफेरेंस थेरेपी अल्ट्रासोनिक थेरेपी ट्रांसकूटेनियस इलेक्ट्रिक नर्व स्टिमुलेशन एंड लॉट मेनी थेरेपीज दिस आर वेरी helpful in acute phase if the patient is having acute pain for initial 7 to 10 days if you start them on this modalities this relieves them of this muscle spasm and increases the vascularity there and the patient is out of bed early with this modalities nowadays we don't use this pelvic traction but what actually pelvic traction is doing it just enforces the bed rest alone otherwise the pelvic traction has no role in the back pain unless belts belts are prescribed if the patient is having some kind of instability in the spine if there is no instability this belts are never prescribed because they are further going to deteriorate your muscles you are going to become dependent on your this things okay coming on to drugs ansets are given for initial acute period say for 4 to 5 days you can give ansets to relieve the acute pain and you can add muscle relaxant with them to decrease the spasm of the muscle this gabapentin and pregabalin are used for long terms and they are used for radicular pain if the patient is only having back pain you don't need to prescribe this gabapentin or pregabalin okay but if the patient is having radicular pain you can use them for longer duration say for 2 months 3 months 4 months depending upon the symptoms how the patient is behaving with this medications okay but this medications have few side effects like the patient will say ki sir mera sar bhari rehta hai isko lene se neend bahut aati hai तो ये सब चीजों का ध्यान रखना है तो यू कैन नॉट स्टार्ट दम विद हाई डोजेज यू ऑलवेज स्टार्ट दम विद लो डोजेज एंड ग्रेजुअली इंक्रीज द डोज दैट पेशेंट्स बॉडी अकोमडेड टू दिस ड्रग्स देन कमिंग आउट टू दिस एस एस आर आईज वाई डू वी नीड एस एस आर आईज इन बैक पेन एज यू ऑल नो द स्ट्रेस इज ऑल्सो वन बिग रीजन ऑफ बैक पेन सो इफ इफ यू फील लाइक वंस यू हैव सीन द पेशेंट एंड यू फील लाइक दैट पेशेंट इज हैविंग स्ट्रेस कम्पोनेंट एज वेल देन यू कैन एड दिस एस एस आर आईज फॉर द ट्रीटमेंट steroids steroids are given if the patient is having severe neurology and severe radicular pain that too for only short duration say for 4 to 5 days or 10 days depending upon the symptomatology now coming on to next part that is spinal injections spinal injections is the modality it is a invasive modality after you have used all this physiotherapy exercises medicines you have consumed everything and the patient is not getting relief of this pain then you can if the patient is having predominantly back pain you can give facet joint block if the patient is having predominantly radicular pain you can give selective nerve root blocks or if the pain is coming from the si joint you can give sij injections so how this nerve root blocks are given now you see with the help of this small uh, very fine needle a uh, 22 gauge spinal needle we go to the foramen now you see can you see this needle reaching the foramen so we go to till the foramen and then we inject a cocktail of uh, bupivacaine and the steroid how does it work it works by reducing the edema at the nerve on the root level okay once this edema is reduced and the irritation of the root is reduced the patient will be relieved of his radicular pain and once he is relieved of his radicular pain he can get back to his activities okay and you can start with the exercises very vigorously if he is out of his bed and he is not having any radicular pain okay so this far we have talked about the non surgical options of management so surgery as i have told you if the pain is persistent for more than 3 months if the patient is having any other pathology such as tumors or anything like that if the patient is having cordic spinal syndrome if you feel that this is very big and it won't be relieved with this conservative management then you go for surgery and what all surgical process you can processes you can do 
So first is the fenestration process. What is actually fenestration? If you uh, see this spine model, inferior part of this uh, superior lamina and some superior part of the inferior lamina is removed. Okay, so this is laminotomy. Now next is hemilaminectomy. Hemilaminectomy mein kya karte hain? Give one half of the lamina hata dete. Hemilaminectomy mein kya half of lamina hata dete hain? Ye jo hai, the patient was having right side, the pain from right side ka lamina. और लैमिनेक्टोमी में कहते हैं जैसे मैंने पूरा रिमूव कर रखा है दिस इज व्हाट वी डू लैमिन और उनका लैमिना है दैट इज लैमिनेक्टोमी ओके तीसरी इसके बाद क्या कर सकते हैं इफ से कि आपने ये सब कर दिया छोटे डिस्क में तो ये काम कर जाएगा बट इफ द डिस्क इज वेरी बिग देन यू नीड टू रिमूव द डिस्क एज वेल देन दैट प्रोसीजर इज नोन एज माइक्रो डिस्केक्टोमी माइक्रो डिस्केक्टोमी में क्या करते हैं हम हम छोटा सा इंसिडेंस ही खोलते हैं अगर पूरा ओपन करके करते हैं, then it is a decompression, a laminectomy, decompression, fusion process. ऐसे ही एक, I'll show you one video as well. दिख रहा है साहब, focus तो कर मेरे भाई. Now you see this video. इसमें this was an open procedure in which we have put in the pedicle screws as well. You can see this pedicle screws there. ये जो दिख रहे हैं this are the pedicle screws, okay? और ये देखिए ये इतना बड़ा disc था इस patient का, this is the disc which I'm holding and this is the dural sac. ये जो दिख रहा है ना, ये dura है, उधर से disc निकाल रहे हैं। देखो कितना बड़ा disc है। If we we are not going to remove this disc, तो जो root है, it will never be decompressed. Even though you do the laminectomy, but the root in the lateral recess is not decompressed. So we need to remove this disc. See, इतना निकालने के बाद भी अभी इतना बचा हुआ है। ये दिख रहा है जो होल्ड कर रखा है दिस इज़ द डिस्क ये जो है ये डिस्क फॉर सब में होल्ड कर रखा है और ये जो है दिस इज़ द ड्यूरल सैक ये जो ब्लू ब्लू दिख रहा है ना इस द ड्यूरल सैक और ये डिस्क का पूरा ये बाहर निकाल रहे हैं उसी का एक इमेज है दिस इज़ uh, with the help of disc, for some I am holding the disc. And this is the dural sac. But what we have done is open procedure. It was a very big disc and the patient was having foot drop on one side. And bowel and bladder was also affected. So whenever you have a coda equina, then they say that we should always do wide laminectomy. So this is the decompression process. Then you go from the left side. Now you see this is the right side. 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 You compress the disc first, then you take out the chunk of disc which is come out. Okay. So this is it. Thank you. Nahi aaj ke liye.